Okay, so this is the third video on collinearity, and today we're going to focus on whether orthogonalization is the answer to collinearity. And I'll just tell you right now, no. The answer is no. Um, any argument you can come up with, uh, you can probably come up with the counter argument for why that's not the case. So let's explain why. Let's have a look. So make sure you're ready. First of all, you have to know what collinearity is, so if you don't, revisit this video. Collinearity, what is it? Is it bad? How do we avoid it? And something I haven't mentioned up until now, and I will now, is that the, the tricky thing with collinearity is that unless you specifically look for it, you won't find it. So you have to specifically look at your regressors and look at different things like the variance inflation factor or the correlations between your regressors, which won't always uh, find the collinearity, as we'll talk about next time. But you have to actually look for it to find it you won't notice anything weird about your parameter estimates necessarily unless you have really bad collinearity and your p-values will look fine and things like that. So you'll want to look for it because when you have collinearity, say in your first level model, you need to be aware that you might have outliers at your group level. So um, yeah, you have to look for it. All right. Again, this, these lectures are all following this paper um, in PLOS One, Orthogonalization of Regressors and fMRI Models by myself and J.B. Pauline and Russ Poldrack. Okay, how does regression naturally work? It's a beautiful thing. Each regressor's p-value only reflects its unique variability. So here we have our dependent variable y, our regressor x1, and the p-value estimate and everything for x1 reflects this shared variability between x1 and y. If I add another regressor to the model, what happens is, say x1 is the regressor of interest and x2 is age. So somebody told you, oh yeah, this, this task often varies with age, so make sure you do an age adjustment. This is the age adjustment. Now the p-value for your regressor of interest solely reflects, hopefully, that regressor, that measure, and it's not being contaminated by the age effect because we've regressed it out. So the p-value for x1 only gets this unique contribution here, ditto for x2, just this unique contribution here, and this part's modeled out, don't worry, it doesn't get ignored, but neither regressor really gets credit for it in the same way. So that's great, that's exactly what we want to do, we always use the wording this is our task adjusted for motion. This is our activation adjusted for age, things like that. So what does orthogonalization do? Orthogonalization takes that shared portion and it says, you know what? I'm gonna give this to just one of the regressors. So for example, X2 could give it up to X1. For that, we would say X2 is orthogonalized with respect to X1. So what's weird here is x2 is the regressor that will change, the numbers in that vector are going to change, but the inferences, the parameter estimate, everything will remain exactly the same for x2, but what happens is that things will change for x1. So x2 is given, we have to change the regressor in x1, in x2, sorry, we change the x2 regressor so that it gives up this portion to x1. So again, the regressor for x2 changes, but x2 still only reflects this unique portion, where now x1 gets both of these chunks. So its p-value will almost always get better, and the parameter estimate may change as well. That's the really misleading thing about this. People do it, and they're like, oh, my p-values went down. I did the right thing. Um, that's not necessarily true. Um, you didn't necessarily do the right thing. And importantly, uh, going back to regressor of interest age, the whole reason for adding age was to adjust x1 for age. Now, after orthogonalization, x1 is no longer adjusted for age. It's going to behave almost as if age wasn't even in the model. Um, it actually will behave, it'll, it'll behave as if age was in the model. Sorry. It'll behave as if age wasn't in the model, but even better um, because the residual variance might go down because of this. And that's not good. That's giving you uh, false hope about what's happening with your data. So what happens to your estimates? So here we're going to go back to this same design as before. You have a stimulus cue followed by a feedback cue. The Venn diagrams are going to be slightly different here. I don't have the dependent variable. I'm just illustrating the two regressors, the stimulus regressor and the feedback regressor. So again, it's a little bit different. So I'm going to do a low collinearity case, high collinearity case, and then the orthogonalized case. 
So starting with low collinearity, there's a three second ISI, so small overlap. The solid blue line is the true value for the parameter estimate for feedback. The solid red line is the true value for the activation estimate for the stimulus. And the little dots are the subject specific estimates um, for stimulus and feedback. So you can see they kind of bounce around the mean as they should. And on average, they are gonna be equal to the truth. Okay, in the high collinearity case, so now there's a lot of overlap because the ISI is one second, um, the data are a little bit noisier. And an interesting thing, which I haven't illustrated up until now, and I, I probably should have done this with the, the R illustration, but the thing about collinearity, as I said at the beginning of this lecture, is that your R squared won't be weird. It won't be really low or really high or any, I don't know, it won't show anything weird. Nothing about your model is going to be weird because the parameter estimates compensate. Remember that game I told you, give me two numbers at sum to 10? Well, if I pick eight, the other number has to be two. If I pick a big number, the other one has to be small to balance it out. And that's exactly what happens here. So the data, the parameter estimates are going to be noisy because of the collinearity. So for subject one, the parameter estimate for stimulus is too high, but things have to remain balanced. So the parameter estimate for feedback is too low. So um, you'll often see when you have collinearity, one effect will be negative when you expected it to be positive and the other one will be positive when you expected it to be negative. Um, and that happens for this subject too. Generally, you can see it happens for all the subjects. As this goes up, this goes down. So here it goes down, here it goes up. You don't really see that over here. So here it goes down a little and this one goes down a little. There isn't this uh, attempt to balance estimates out as there is in the high collinearity case. So you can see that this path is kind of negatively correlated with this path. That's exactly the collinearity. But we're still good as we saw last time. Type one errors are preserved. Power just takes a hit. Um, kind of no big deal, <laughs> but kind of, yeah, because um, low powered studies are kind of the <sighs> big issue with neuroimaging data. Okay, so what happens with orthogonalization? So now this purple region, which neither regressor was getting credit for before, we're now just gonna give that to stimulus. But what happens now, is you can see the stimulus, the feedback stays exactly the same. The data used here are exactly the same as the data used here. So you can see these blue dots are bouncing around in exactly the same way. But now what happens is we get overestimates for the stimulus because it's now taking this feedback activation, which was much higher than the stimulus activation. And you can see it's pretty much the sum of two plus one. So these are now bouncing around near three because they're reflecting not only the stimulus activation, but the feedback activation as well. So you're given this false hope about your activation. You might be thinking, wow, my stimulus activation is huge, when it's not. Um, so this can happen with motion. I've had people argue with me when they orthogonalize their motion regressors with respect to task. I'm like, oh, um, you know, you can't do that. It's no longer... I mean, he pretty much threw those motion regressors in there for nothing. And they, the, the argument that was given back to me was, in the part of the brain I'm interested in, I know there won't be a motion artifact. I don't know what Oracle told them there wouldn't be motion artifact in that part of the brain. There's no way you can conclude that. Um, if they knew that much, then they should have known what their task activation would be too. So you, we, we don't know these things. We can't predict it. So we just have to run... The GLM without orthogonalization, if we had task correlated motion, shoot. We just took a hit in power, but let's do the honest thing. Let's not be reporting uh, motion related artifact as our task activation. Okay, so orthogonalization can lead to very misleading results. It basically uncontrols one covariate for the other. So previously it was controlled, now it's uncontrolled. Controlled for age, now we remove the ability of age to do that. And again, that's the entire reason we model multiple regressors. And I already said this about uh, motion. If you orthogonalize motion with respect to task, you're not fixing collinearity, you're just producing misleading results at all. So this isn't working at all. 
please don't do it. Your orthogonalized model behaves basically as if you admitted motion. Just to recap, orthogonalization is not a band-aid for collinearity. I can't stress this enough. So is orthogonalization ever okay? I mean, it's an option in both FSL and SPM. Yes, actually it is okay. Remember when we are mean centering covariates? I think I even mentioned in that lecture, if you haven't seen it, you can uh, go back. It's probably around day six or day seven of the summer cram session. Um, yeah, mean, mean centering covariates is a form of orthogonalization. And here we do it because we want, to, so let's say we have age and our intercept in the model. If we don't mean center the age regressor, the interpretation of the intercept is the brain activation for somebody who is zero years old, which makes no sense. If you mean center age, it becomes brain activation for the average age. Yay, that makes sense. It also makes sense when you have parametric modulation. So I haven't really covered parametric modulation here yet. I'm just hoping you're familiar with it. So this would be if you had some type of behavioral measure uh, for each stimulus. So uh, let's say you, uh, one task that comes to mind is gambling. A gambling task where for each gamble, there's uh, the possibility of a gain and the possibility of a loss. So each stimulus has a gain and a loss associated with it. So you might modulate the regressor height prior to convolution according to the gain or according to the loss. And in this case, it's the same idea as mean centering. You always include an unmodulated regressor, and that should re represent the mean activation for that task. But it won't unless your modulated regressors have been uh, either orthogonalized. But I typically, honestly, when I have parametrically modulated regressors, I just mean center the modulation values before popping them in. But, um, right, we still want the modulation regressors to reflect the unique variability of that modulation value. So, beware of what your software does. So the setup here for this last example is modeling the stimulus intensity and reaction time as parametric modulators. I will talk a lot more about reaction time soon in reaction time modeling. I'm finishing up a project based on a OHBM poster from uh, two years ago. Uh, okay, so orthogonalization is okay here. So I have three regressors, one unmodulated, one modeling uh, stimulus intensity, and one modeling the reaction time. So the goal is to orthogonalize each of reaction time and intensity with respect to the unmodulated regressor. So, right, modulated regressors, what are they? So here, these are the unconvolved regressors. So the red one is unmodulated. It has the same height for each trial. Um, then let's say the reaction time gets longer for each trial. This blue one, the height is now modulated by the reaction time. And the green one is modulated by the stimulus intensity. So you can see there's some correlation between reaction time and stimulus intensity. And then you convolve them and you get something like this. The red is the regressor for the unmodulated. You would model that along with the RT modulation and with the stimulus intensity modulation. So then, for example, uh, the parameter estimate for stimulus intensity would be the uh, relationship between bowl activation for that stimulus type and the intensity of the stimulus. So it's, it's like a slope over trials. It's not like a slope over trials. It is a slope over trials. Uh, so slope between brain activation and stimulus intensity. Okay, so this is the model we're working with. It's just we want to make sure that when we look at the red regressor's parameter estimate, it truly reflects the overall average activation for that stimulus. As it is now, it will reflect the activation for the stimulus when the reaction time is zero and the stimulus intensity is zero, which doesn't make sense. So here, our Venn diagram's getting busy. Again, no dependent variable here. I'm just showing the regressors of interest. So if we don't orthogonalize, in this case, it's doing the wrong thing because we want the unmodulated regressor, the blue one should get credit for this chunk and this chunk. So we need RT to give up this purple chunk to the unmodulated. We need the intensity regressor to give up this chunk to unmodulated like this. This is what we want. Unmodulated now gets all of this variability. This part gets Nobody gets credit for, RT gets credit for this part, intensity gets credit for this part. 
So RT has been orthogonalized with respect to the unmodulated regressor, and intensity has been orthogonalized with respect to the unmodulated regressor. So two orthogonalizations. Importantly, intensity, this yellow part hasn't been given to RT or to intensity. It's just properly nobody gets credit for it. That's the correct thing to do. But SPM, uh, older versions than SPM 12, does this. Um, it depends on the order you put your regressors in the model. So this was something that confused me for years as SPM users would ask me, does order, the order that I put the regressors in the model matter? I'm like, no, it's the GLM. Like the order has nothing to do with anything. They're like, it does. When I change it, my activation changes. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. I don't know what SPM's doing. I think it was this. So here, the RT modulated, modulation was added first. The intensity was added second. So the older versions of SPM, you know, SPM knew it has to do the orthogonalization. It just doesn't do it quite right. The first one gets orthogonalized with respect to the unmodulated one. So bingo for RT. But then intensity gets orthogonalized with respect to the unmodulated and RT. So, uh-oh, this yellow portion has been given to RT. So it's weird. The intensity regressor was the one that was not orthogonalized correctly, but the RT one is the one that'll have the wrong interpretation. And again, that's just how orthogonalization works. You change one regressor, but its parameter estimates don't change. The one that received the extra chunk changes. So that's not good. Then of course, if we put intensity first and then RT second, the yellow chunk is given to intensity instead. So uh, if you're using SPM eight or older, you just have to be careful about this. I don't think there's a way to turn it off, but basically you would have to run it both of these ways. And when RT goes first, ignore it. So only look at the activation map for the last parametric modulation that was added. If that makes sense. And then you would have to run this model and then to get the RT effect. Oh no, SPM. Just it's it's not a huge deal. Uh, there's no way to make a perfect software package. What's important though, what's what's on you as the user of a software package is to learn how it works. So if it's doing something that's not exactly the way you want it, you can fix it. No software package that I've seen does everything exactly the way I want to do it. But as long as I know when it's doing things kind of weird and I can adjust for it, I'll be fine. So I'm not picking on SPM in any way, shape, or form. It's a great software package. So SPM 12 does now give you an option to set this by hand. So that's great. And make sure you use that option correctly. So in summary, don't orthogonalize unless you're mean centering. And um, I'm using the term mean centering uh, for parametric modulation as well. So parametric modulation, mean centering, you're fine. But if you are using the automatic orthogonalization for parametrically modulated regressors, make sure your software is doing what you want it to do. Again, if you do orthogonalize, the p-value for the regressor you changed won't change. But the regressor you orthogonalized with respect to will change. The p-value will almost decrease. And although it feels good, it's not good. The regressor that was actually changed will have exactly the same p-value, parameter estimate, and everything else. That's it. Thanks a lot, and have a great day.